Hello and welcome to episode 86, part 1, the astronomy show for August 2019. Autumn's beginning to kick the arse out of summer and restore hope that the inevitable darker skies are truly coming back for the patient amateur astronomer. True darkness isn't just some folklore whispered about nostalgically, but a now tangible phenomenon as astronomical twilight gives way this month to faint fuzzy hunting and astrophotography. After two months of skies that never get fully dark, August begins with three hours of night and six hours by month's end. Don't take my word for it, that's science, folks. I'm Ralph, your host for this month, and joining me is the rocket man who's been warned about burning out his fuse up here alone, Paul. Hello! And the lady strung out on heaven's high, hitting an all-time low, is Jenny. Cooey! So guys, what's been happening this month has been a quite a bit of Apollo 11 stuff, but since this is the astronomy show, uh, rather than the space exploration show, what has been happening? Nothing, it's just been Apollo 11. It has been Apollo 11, hasn't it? <laughs> oh, well, I've been busy. It's been four weeks of constant Apollo space. No, yeah, you ha- you've you been going and going and going, what? doing all sorts. Workshops, shows, on stage. I've been, yeah, everywhere. Um, lots of the science fairs, most of the science fairs, especially across the south of England and the EP schools. And but this must be a bumper time for you, right? With space ex- space science and space education, this must be just perfect for you. Like when Tim Peake went up in the uh, the space station. Um, yeah, and Apollo. And what was really great uh, on the landing day, um, I was in Dorchester, uh, down in Dorset, and they have this uh, fantastic. Um, sort of Neolithic site so there's right in this town called a Mornbury Ring um, it's this big Neolithic earthwork um, so thousands of years old and the, the, the Romans had converted it into an amphitheatre so it's been an amphitheatre for sort of 2,000 years and in it they had set up um, a, a big stage massive screens mm. um, and set up a whole Apollo celebration and they called it Moonbury um, ah. a festival uh, it was just the most amazing uh, event fantastic stuff everywhere all about space and, and really well attending thousands of people that's amazing um, and so it was on stage doing the, the show there just on the on the day when the, the landing happened it was just incredible just brilliant atmosphere and what's the feeling been like from people that are non-astro apollo nerds what what's the public you, you get an idea of this because you're going out and speaking to people that are both astro people and normal people what, what's the what's the feeling like out there and yeah, well, I mean, as it, it is, you, you can feel that there's been real kind of people have been really um, encouraged by it, it's been really mm. sort of into it. It, it. You can feel there's been this really good atmosphere around the whole thing. And yeah, I mean, you know, normally you, you get people who um, you know, they know Neil Armstrong. He, he's, he's clearly he's one of the most famous people in, in, in history and it's one of those famous humans. Of course, yeah. He, he's Christopher Columbus or Sir Walter Raleigh, isn't he? Yeah. Um, probably always will be, yeah. Um, but you, you could tell over the last week, especially as you got closer and closer to the, 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 the weekend, and the, the people were getting excited about it. There's been some really good programming on, on, on TV. There's been some fantastic programs and really, really well done. Um, I'd like, actually, I just mentioned the BBC Radio. Um, all the BBC channels, whatever BBC radio station you tune into, they, they had some really great Apollo sort of theme mm. stuff and mm. stuff with, sort of music and, and, and stuff with the feeds and things like that. Really, really well done. Um, brilliant, brilliant um, coverage all weekend. Um, Nobody listens to Radio Paul. Get over it. Yeah, to be it. fair, I was thinking that. But I didn't want to say it because you were like waxing <laughs> lyrical about it. I was like, I can't can't ruin the mojo. Well, I listen to radio and millions just do and it's brilliant. <laughs> so there. I did a workshop in Trajiga. Oh. With our good friend Gavin Price. Oh. Well, I hope you weren't professing to be an Apollo expert if you got Gav there. Good Lord, no. But it was alright because it was just kids, so it was fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, we did the moon and we did Apollo 11. Borrows my friend's uh, Lego Saturn V, which blew their tiny little brains out the water. <laughs> um, it was great. Yeah, it was good fun. It was. It's hard, though. Like, I feel for Paul doing all the workshops and stuff because 
um like i only did three of them sort of i did two of them back to back and then i had a lunch break and then i did like the second one and i'm not shooting fire or anything i'm just like i did six shows on the friday before the the the, the landing weekend in a row so there i do you know what i was dying <laughs> after two paul this is your job jenny's got to do a phd at the same time yeah. But I do you know what I feel for you because I was like sweating. If I had them, my box would have been gone because they would have been sweated <laughs> off by like the end of them. Oh, I enjoy. Mean, actually, it's been so hot. Um, I actually, I, I actually lost about half a stone. I think over the last month, it's been incredible. Um, I've been wearing the spacesuit on stage and things like that. And then I, mean, I have three spacesuits. Um, and of course. Like, workshops to get kids to, to try them on but there's one spacesuit that I basically use as my kind of costume no one else can wear it it is yeah it, it, it's fettered nastiness it is it it's it really rank it <laughs> no it, 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 it almost it's almost audible how because it's just rank is smelly it smelly it is um, yeah it's just for display purposes <laughs> can you like <laughs> stick it in the washing machine <laughs> well, yeah I mean yeah they can be cleaned I mean I I've got, Gig the uh, the other two I got cleaned before the whole kind of Apollo month and everything, so they, they were ready. But yeah, yeah this one is um, yeah, it's just for me only, and um, yeah, yeah, all the water would kind of you know it all <laughs> melt inside and yeah. and, and, and sort it's of like pour out feet and look like I pissed now. myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> gather it up with the bottle, all the water gathering in your legs mm. at the bottom, sloshing. <laughs> oh Christ. Well, moving on to emails, our good friend uh, and regular contributor, Mark DeVrige, some say Mark DeVray, but not us, um, he says, dear most terrifying... Inv- because we will not be taught. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I mean, we know best, obviously. <laughs> Just because he claims that that's his name doesn't necessarily mean that he's right. <laughs> and as we'll hear later on, a uh, bit of a spoiler for later... We've got a real duchy on the show, but there's just a teaser for you. So Mark DeVrige, some say Mark DeVray, says, Dear most terrifying invaders from the Red Planet and the growing in craftiness Jenny. Crafty you know Jenny, I am, aren't I? You are. I am. I was listening to your most recent episode and as always, cracking hour of joy to listen to. That's nice. I do love a bit of groveling before before getting into the meat of an argument. However, I did have to listen to one bit twice, and not just because I get it from both yourselves, and again from 365 Days of Astronomy, would absolutely recommend that people not only listen to us once, but also listen to us on 365 Days of Astronomy. Mark goes on to say, loved their interjection in part two episode last month, and I don't know if you guys heard this, but um, on 365 Days of Astronomy, they took a listen to the podcast before they put it out, or the episode before they put it out, and because we'd given them a reference about we might be too much filth in the show for them, they actually um, edited over the, uh, the podcast and said, no, we're quite happy with that, off you go. Um, and and uh, Richard, who who edits it and who, who who runs the show at 365 Days of Astronomy, he actually emailed me first and said, "Hope you don't mind this, guys. We've just put a little bit of uh, audio over the top of yours, so that was nice to hear." Yeah. It also shows that other people are listening to it too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that would be my uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, the masturbation uh, introduction, <laughs> won't it? There, yeah. <laughs> It was exactly that when you were uh, rather fruity. <laughs> yeah, I really liked their interjection. I thought that was brilliant from, from 365. I yeah. enjoyed that. So Mark says, uh, the reason that he got in touch was that there was an error. Can you believe an error? We we did an error. We don't do um, errors. We just do things differently, Mark. I'm glad you said that in advance. So Mark reckons that... He wouldn't. Well, he says he wouldn't normally mention it, except he made the point of explaining the errors... In the planets, so uh, we were discussing um, the show, the the Brian Cox show, and we we were pointing out that there were errors in the in the program. And he says that I was discussing Saturn at opposition and said that opposition is when Saturn lies between us and the Sun, hmm. which quite clearly is a really difficult feat to achieve. <laughs> uh, he says I don't know much, but I'm fairly certain Saturn cannot get between us and the Sun unless through your advanced technology. I guess this is why you should get an astronomer to read the Sky Guide, right, Jenny? Ah! Ooh! <laughs> oh, my God, I know. 
<laughs> Do you know what, right? <laughs> this is the perfect example yep. of pot calling the kettle black. Just about. <laughs> Burnt. (laughs) He says, as I know your secret that even the mighty Martians are fallible, that's not true, Mark, but okay, we'll carry on. Might I be spared come the invasion? Well, possibly, but we don't like things being pointed out when we're wrong. Yeah, because he he did to point out a crack. Hmm. And then finally, we have an audio intervention from our friend Ral van Eindhoven, who is decidedly Dutch, who says, Awesome overlords, as promised, the correct way of saying Kuipers and Huygens, your humble alien, Ral. So here, for anybody that has any doubts as to how the proper, correct Dutch pronunciation of Kuiper and Huygens, here we go. Hello, Martian overlords. And Keeper of the Peace, our Welsh Queen, Jenny. Um, Yes, it was me who was complaining about how you guys were pronouncing the words Kuipers and Huygens. So, here you go. This is the correct way of saying it. It is Kuipers and Huygens. Love your show. This is Raoul, signing off from Farringdonia Base in Oxfordshire. Bye. Well, it's time for the content created by the real heroes of our age, the men and women of science who enlighten, enrich and elevate our world with new knowledge and tried, tested and repeated experimentation to give us confidence. They're not just pulling this stuff out of their arses, but have the skills to back it up. You might not even know that the word news came into the language in the 14th century to mean the presentation of new information. You always learn something new on this show. So ladies first, Jen. What new information do you have this month? I'm going to kick us off with not something that everyone would want to see, but something that some would simply love. And I'm definitely Mm -hmm. on the side of wanting to see this. And it is a dusty ring. Whoa, who doesn't want to see that? (laughs) Now we're talking Alma, and no, not Alma, gold member of Eastbourne Swingers Association, 1992. (laughs) (laughs) but the atacama large millimeter array and its recent observations of pds 70 a young stellar system surrounded by a dusty ring and exoplanets the star itself lies some 370 light years away from earth and it's only about 10 million years old that's really young compare Mm. that to the four and a half billion years for our solar system Mm. and a hundred million years for the rings of saturn which are Not dust, they're made of ice. But it just kind of puts it in perspective for you. Mm. Recent images taken by Alma have revealed, for the first time, tantalising signs of a circumplanetary disk. That is, a disk orbiting one of the planets in the solar system. Oh, I know where this is going then. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. So, it's not a disk of gas and dust orbiting the star from which the planets are forming, but... It's a ring of dust around the planet in the system. Just to re- reiterate that, it's a ring of dust around the planet, which is just mind-blowing. So this ob- observation came from ALMA, and the data was combined with optical and infrared data from the VLT, or the Very Large Telescope. And apart from being awesome, this observation is absolutely crucial for supporting many of the planet formation theories that we've got today. Now, the idea is that moon should form in a similar way to the planets. Now, the planets form out of material left over from the formation of the star that is kind of swirling around it in a disk. And then this phenomenon should be replicated on a smaller scale for the moons. The central star becomes the planet and the forming planets become forming moons. The planet in question is PDS 70C and it lies about the same distance away from its own star as Neptune does with the sun. And it's got a mass between one and ten times that of Jupiter. It's relatively unknown. But PDS 70B isn't any average Joe either. Now this planet, planet B, lies at a similar distance to Uranus and seems to have dust trailing behind it, a bit like a comet's tail. Well, maybe, anyway, because those observations are really, they're really uncertain. That is definitely a maybe. Either way, 
This amazing bit of work is the first time we have evidence of moons forming around a planet outside the solar system. And if that isn't cool enough, maybe we should remind you that we're still discovering moons in our solar system, let alone something that's 370 million light years away. So yeah, basically, dust is awesome and everyone should study it. That's a really good point. I've not considered that. We are still finding moons in our solar system at the same time that we're discovering moons, not just around exoplanets, but forming around exoplanets. Yep. So, second story, I'm going much, much further from home. And I'm in search of a powerful scream from the darkness. Are you intrigued? Indeed. Good, because that's what we're here for. Be a bit shit if we did that some drama, wouldn't it? So my second story <laughs> is that for the second time ever, astronomers have managed to pinpoint a fast radio burst, one of the strangest and, as of yet, unexplained phenomenon in the universe. A fast radio burst is, as you might have guessed, a very short burst of radio waves, and they can last just a few thousandths of a second at the most. But in that tiny time scale, the amount of energy released can be as much as the sun emits over the course of a century. I didn't realise they were so energetic. Oh, they are phenomenal. Mm. And this this is why they're so curious, because people are like, How, what can make that much energy in such a short amount of time? Yeah. Mm. Now, the fast radio burst, or FRB, uh, the one in question, is very unusual, because it is a known repeating source. So that means it, you know, it goes off regularly, well, reasonably regularly. There's only two known at the time of recording this. But what makes this so rare, apart from it being one of only one of two repeaters, is that astronomers manage to really pinpoint its source. And normally in astronomy, when we say pinpoint, we're kind of like, oh, it's in this region. No, they really mean pinpoint. Um, the burst of energy was detected by ASCAP, or the Australian Kilometre Array Pathfinder, which is an array of 36 radio dishes. And by measuring the time delay and the signal arriving at all the different dishes, the astronomers managed to basically triangulate its location on the sky, but using 36 you know, different directions. Mm. And they managed to do it within, ready? Mm. Nought point, nought, 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 two degrees. Blimey. Yeah. Now, the burst was found to occur on the edge of a galaxy 3.6 billion light years away. And this is a really important discovery because it means that it rules out the source being a supermassive black hole because the FRB was found so far away from the galactic centre. Mm. It also implies that FRBs can be caused by a variety of different mechanisms. There's some suggestion that this FRB may have been caused by a magnetar, which is a highly magnetised neutron star. But really, that's all conjecture. No one really knows. But as we slowly tally up the number of FRBs, which currently only stands at 85, the picture will slowly become clearer. But there are only certain amount of things that this can be. It has to be something hugely energetic, like a neutron star yeah. or a black hole, doesn't it? Yeah, but what the actual mechanism is and whether all those things are causing these FRBs or if it's just one thing or are there different types, like you get different types of supernovae, are there different types of FRBs, nobody knows. Mm. It's a huge mystery. So your final story, Jen, what have we got? This one is just a quick update on something that we quite often discuss here on the Good Ship Awesome. And that is the Hubble constant. Mm, always now, in the barrage. Mm -hmm. If you could encompass the history of the universe in one number, then the Hubble constant, or the Hubble parameter, is probably it. It describes the expansion of the universe over cosmic time, and in doing so tells us about the universe we live in. We can work out what it's made of in terms of baryonic matter, so you know that's kind of like everyday matter, what everything we see around us is made of, dark matter, and dark energy. But the exact rate of that expansion is hotly debated because the way we measure it seems to affect the value that we actually determine for the Hubble constant. So measurements of the cosmic microwave background, or the CMB, give us a value of 67 kilometres per second per megaparsec. And what does that actually mean? Which is That's a weird the expansion unit. rate of the universe, isn't it? Yeah, so it's basically for every megaparsec you go away from the Earth, uh, you'll be expanding at a rate of 67 kilometres per second. So the further away you are, 
the more um, it expands. Like, it's the more, the faster it's going. Yeah. From our point of view. Yeah. Um, now, measurements of the nearby universe using type 1a supernovae and Cepheid variable stars, which are what we call standard candles, they give us a much larger value of about 73 to 76 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, this seems to indicate that the universe is expanding faster now than it did in the past, which is a bit weird. Mm. But there's been another measurement using red giant stars in the nearby universe, and this gives us a middle-of-the-road value of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So, yeah, we still don't know what the real value is. Or whether the differences we see are real or an artifact is something we aren't accounting for in our models of the universe. So to solve the debate, we're going to need to wait for LIGO to detect more merging neutron stars, giving us another independent estimation, and also for the estimates from the previously discussed methods to get more accurate. So but of course, we, we all we love to know. see something that's right in the middle because that makes us feel more comfortable, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But then if you expand it back over the history of the universe, those small changes now make a huge difference. Yeah to like the age of the universe and all its history and stuff. So this is why they obsess about getting it absolutely, absolutely right. right. Because it amplifies it over time. Yeah. Okay then, Paul, what have you got for us? Okay, for my first story, uh, it's about one of those Neptune-like exoplanets. Uh, you know the ones, you know, there's these planets, they're like super Earths and these ones are like Jupiters. And of course these ones are like Neptunes. Well, it turns out in this case, it, Gliese 3470b, snappy title, um, is not particularly Neptune-like at all. Um, Mm. This planet is actually, uh, it's a a class referred to as mini-Neptunes. Now, of course, um, Neptune's an excise up from Earth, so if you think of of Earth being the largest of the rocky planets, and then there's this big jump to Neptune, that's the next planet in order of size in our solar system. Well, there's this sort of group of mini-Neptunes, as they've been called, which have been found by Kepler, Mm. um, and and actually the most common type of planet that Kepler's been finding. and it's actually one that we, is not represented in our solar system. There, there is this sort of missing class of planet in our solar system. So we're very interested in them anyway because um, there is quite a large jump between Earth and Neptune. So here, here are these planets that seem to sort of fit in that gap. <laughs> um, and the, the sort of further investigation of them um, by the University of Montreal, uh, I mean, that politest of nations, Canada. So <laughs> using Hubble and Spitzer, the team led by Bjorn Benick looked at the atmosphere of this planet uh, by spectroscopically delving into the absorption of the parent star's light. Well, while mm-hmm. Neptune is rich in water and methane, 3470b isn't. In fact, the results suggest that the atmosphere is clear. Huh. Yeah, it's clear. Um, it's just a thin haze mm. and is predominantly the same hydrogen helium makeup as our own sun. Um, oh. So... Yeah, this suggests that this planet was able to hoover up this stuff um, in the early stages of that system's formation. Um, and then, of course, something happened to sort of remove the, 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 the rest of the material, um, something probably the star did, and um, so they didn't hoover up enough material um, to become a Jupiter, and it just became a mini-Neptune. So it's sort of fascinating look at, at these these planets that would be the most common that Kepler have found. So next is time for stars that undergo drastic plastic surgery, and I'm not talking about Hollywood A-listers. This is a partial explanation for a mystery that grew up around some observer giants. Now, there are two different experiments. Uh, CORROT, which is the Convection, Rotation and Transits mission. I know. And Apogee, the Apache Point Observatory Galactic Evolution Experiment. So they looked at some red giants and they gave two answers about the ages. So Corot saw vibrations in these stars that were suggested of their masses. And they gave an age of around 6 billion years for these stars. Okay, But Apogee found the stars to be metal poor. It was an experiment looking at the metal content of stars. And it indicated a much more ancient 10 billion years. So just a small 4 billion year gap then. Well, a team from Max Planck and Ohio State University have explained, well, at least some of these gaps, some of these stars, in a paper that's been published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. They pointed to the ratios of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen of some of these stars um, being that of typical low-mass stars. 
So in other words, these stars were results of stellar mergers. Um, and that they were very old stars disguised in the mass of much younger stars. That's just blown my mind about stars merging and staying yeah, stable and, uh, to make like another bigger uh, star. It'd be really interesting to see how this how this, this stability issue works. Uh, yeah, exactly what I was thinking. That you know, after, after when I've got more time, I was going to delve into myself. How 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 do you get stars to uh, oh. merge stably? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so. Saskia Hecker, who led the study, pointed out that their large mass is not an original property um, and therefore not suitable for age determination. Um, This didn't work for all the stars in the study, though. Um, So some of the stars they looked at had ratios of the oxygen, nitrogen and carbon things that indicate um, a higher mass to begin with. So they still got this age different so the mystery continues more work to be done and sticking with mass for my last story uh, it's about one of my favorite objects in the sky planetary nebulae Um, in this case it's the discovery of the first planetary from a star of more than three times solar mass now we know that big stars those over eight solar masses of course go supernovae Um, and the, the lower, no, not the lowest mass stars, of course, fall apart into planetary nebulae. But no example from a star greater than three solar masses has ever been found until now. Of course, it, it, what it means is there's this sort of gap. So there's a, a sort of gap between um, the sort of three solar masses where we've observed at this point and the eight solar masses. So there's sort of three to eight gap. Um, and it hasn't been observed until now. So a team from the University of Hong Kong looked at a planetary in the cluster NGC 6067, um, which is in the constellation Norma. Um, now, your people in the north will scratch their heads over if you where's Norma. Of course, it's in the southern hemisphere, um, so that's probably why you haven't heard of it. Um, the stars in this cluster were all of the same age, um, so all formed in this cloud, all formed together, so they're all the same age. Um, and of course, then different mass stars live for different amounts of times, notwithstanding the last story. So you can determine the originator mass of a planetary within the cluster um, because, of course, if it's already a planetary nebula and you know when the star was formed, you know, of course, how long it lasted and therefore age of stars is generally determined by mass. So you're able to sort of work out what the mass of that star was. So from when it formed a planetary, when it collapsed. Um, And so um, in this case, the result was 5.5 solar masses. Mm. So you're right in the middle of that 3 to 8 zone, right smack in the centre. Um, so, yeah, this is this is really interesting. It's something we've not seen before. It was something that um, was, was assumed to be the case, that the, 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 you, it would form a planetary nebula. But here's, here's a piece of evidence. Yes, the stars over 3 solar masses do form planetary nebulas, and it's not even just a little bit over 3, it's 5.5. Um, and that paper can be found in Nature Astronomy. Okay, so, well, for the big news story for this month, um, there's probably nothing bigger, especially if we um, uh, shed off our Western Hemisphere bias, than the Hawaii telescope protests, uh, which are raging, as you would expect, in Hawaii because of um, issues over the, I guess, uh, desecration of of spiritual lands. Uh, Who wants to take this one away? It's a really tricky situation, isn't it? Mm, it is. And especially for us as well, because we really want to see advancement in science, but we have yeah. to be so... We have to recognise the right of people in these countries not to have spiritual lands desecrated. Oh, yeah, 100%. Because it's all kicking off about the 30-metre telescope, right? This is what it's all about. It's this brand-new telescope that's being built on the summit of Mauna Kea, um, in Hawaii and there there are already I think about a dozen telescopes um, on the summit and this is the last one that's going to be built on fresh land so after the TMT or 30 meter telescope any other telescopes need to be built you basically have to get rid of an old one before you build the new one um, and astronomers like Hawaii because it's like what 4,000 meters up which means that you're above a lot of the atmosphere you're above a lot of the water vapors you can do it's really good for infrared astronomy, far infrared astronomy in particular, sort of submillimeter stuff. This is why astronomers like Mauna Kea. But 
for native Hawaiians, Mauna Kea is sacred land. So there is this this huge balance that has been raging for years. Like this is not the first time it's happened. No, no, no. We've discussed it on this show before, I think. Yeah, yeah. But this time, I think it's really, really kicking off. And from what yeah. I know, um, I think that the plans that have been agreed to are like not being stuck to or that the plans have changed and that the general public have not been advised that the plans have changed. Uh So I think that's part of it. I think part of it is you also have, because some of the native Hawaiians are fine with, with, you know, the telescopes being built because um, they, they understand sort of, the the want of the the astronomical community to use Mauna Kea because it's, it is like literally the best place that you can possibly go on the Earth, so they understand that they know that the telescopes pump money back into like the University of Hawaii and into the surrounding area, but then there are others pointing out and quite rightly so that you know Mauna Kea is sacred, um, and part of their culture and it should be protected and it shouldn't just be walked all over and used to like build giant buildings on top of it should be respected. Mm. And so, yeah, think, so this is this is the balance that we've got going on. Yeah, I think Paul g- gave a really good analogy um, in a, an offline conversation on the Kushner back channel that we were using, where uh, where he said it's like someone wanted to come and build a telescope on Stonehenge or something. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think what I was saying was um, that it's a sort of very Western idea. You know, we look at um, sort of you know, mountains as you know somewhat this we don't see anything there and but if if you were um to sort of say you were going to construct something next to Stonehenge or Scara Bray in the UK and so two great sort of ancient sites which don't have sort of necessarily religious meaning as such you know certainly in the modern religious sense but they they're, they're cultural historical they have this sort of great deep meaning to 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 local and national culture mm. and and that's what you're looking at here there's this sort of you know you've got to remember hawaii um i mean i was going to say it's it's different to the other states but in some ways it's not different to the other states in the u.s in that um the, the, the indigenous native populations exist all over um the united states and all over the americas but hawaii because it's sort of isolated from the mainland is some respects is viewed in, in some circles as more like a colony and so this is sort of colonial neo-colonial if you like aspect that you you have a sort of native population that sees america's presence in hawaii as just that as a presence not you know fully part of the united states in that sense and that there is a bit of an independent movement that exists in hawaii um and of course only you know about a third of the population of the sort of you know, claim sort of native heritage um, so you can have a large number of the population that, that kind of support TMT, but actually um, there is this distinct group that perhaps don't. And it, it's it's more than just viewing it through that prism of just like oh it's you know it's religion versus science something like that. this is a sort of cultural historical thing. And and there have been protests in the past. And I think it's about sensitivity. Um, and of course if you know if, if astronomy if science can't do the sensitivity because most scientists you know are quite liberal and 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 sensitive to these things i hope i mean there's many cases where they're not but if they can't get it right then who the hell is going to get this sort of thing right and i think i think this is very delicate and, and it's difficult and of course you know who doesn't want to see the tmt built i want to see the 30 meters it's going to be, be immense it's going to be an amazing instrument and i'd love to see it built and you know, want it built quickly and, and and well and but also we do have to you know we can't trample on on culture and history all the time you know it is not just all about science and things all the time we, we have to respect sort of other people's views so in summary then we've got sympathies with both sides and we vehemently argue for both sides but they're both contradictory to one another yeah but yeah i think we're just gonna have to watch this one and see how it plays out and report back next month um a delicacy we, we one to watch and report on Well, as we're already talking about devices to find objects in the night sky and hopefully avoiding the wrath of local populations, that sets us up nicely for the sky guide and our recommended picks for the amateur astronomers this month as the nights just start to lengthen. Paul, what do you have for us in the solar system this month? Ah, planets. Well, if you're in the mood for great views of the planets, I'm afraid August 2019 is not your time. Um, We do have five visible planets. 
uh, and two of them are Jupiter and Saturn. And any other time, you'd be dizzy with the prospects of five planets, including Jupiter and Saturn. But they're low in the southern sky, fighting the summer haze and dust. Jupiter slipping towards the sun, so not that great. Mercury, um, of course, is one of the others. It's one for the persistent and patient, uh, the early birds. It appears about 5am in the sky, already bright with sunshine. Um, it's at greatest western elongation. And so for those who want to try this, uh, it's your best chance for the winged messenger this year, probably. Um, and your best chance is between the 10th and the 16th, where Mercury gains its greatest altitude. The other two planets on offer are Neptune, more of which in a moment with Jenny, um, and Uranus, which is the best of the bunch in terms of altitude. The only one of the bunch that actually gets any serious height above the crap-filled horizon. Jupiter is between Scorpius and the Ficus, Saturn is in Sagittarius, Uranus between Pisces and Cetus, while Mercury is sitting in Cancer. The other solar system highlight, of course, this month um, is the Perseids. They need little introduction, one of the biggest meteor showers of the year with 50 to 70 a minute, when we hit peak on the 12th and 13th. Unfortunately, the moon is full on the 15th, so this is unlikely to be a vintage year, but the <coughs> weather will be warm and it is always worth a look. Mm, so it's a shame it's for nice the Perseids. Weather. Get outside, go and have a look, go and enjoy yeah. it. Um, but it's not going to be a great year without bright moon. Yeah. Yeah, so as you said, Paul, uh, not a lot going on with planets. So I'm just going to stick with Neptune and encourage you to go for a challenge because, you know, why not? So Neptune, furthest planet from the sun in the solar system. Um, and alongside Uranus is one of the most unexplored planets too. Neptune is very faint, it's sitting at around magnitude 7.8, so you'll need a reasonably sized telescope to try and spot it. But fortunately, Neptune's actually sitting pretty closely to the star Phi Aquarii. So if you draw a line between Phi and Lambda in that constellation, and then you extend it by about a degree or so, you should kind of skim over Neptune. And Neptune will appear as a bluish disc in the eyepiece, and that's how you'll tell it's Neptune and not a star, because it will appear distinctly round. It's also a pretty, you know, big achievement, I think, to have a look at the furthest planet in the yeah. solar system. Yeah. Neptune's gonna rise at about eleven PM, but it only gets to about thirty one degrees. Uh, above the horizon and it does so just when the sky is starting to get light again um so yeah it's not ideal but at least you can try and see a planet this month maybe and it is heading towards opposition which is going to be in september so i guess august is a good time to kind of practice finding it so that you know what you're looking for when it's at its brightest so moving out beyond the solar system now what suggestions do we have further afield paul well, I've got two deep sky challenges for you this month. Um, first of all, I'm going to point you sort of in the direction of a peculiar galaxy in Aquarius uh, in the shape of NGC 7727. Um, this is an interesting interacting galaxy. It's about magnitude 11, and it's a real oddity. It has two bright cores um, and various tendrils spiralling out. The explanation at present is that this is a 76 million light year object um, as a result of a collision between two spirals about a billion years ago. Um, and what we're witnessing is the interaction as the two galaxies merge and form an elliptical. Of course, if you listen to our podcast extra with Professor Karen Masters last month, um, that might not necessarily actually be the case, that, that sort of merging um, spirals form in ellipticals, um, and they, this is now being challenged. Um, and, but of course, this merger, this is the eventual fate of, of galaxy and Andromeda, so it's, it's worth to have a look at. Um, this peculiar um, galaxy is found at the eastern end of Aquarius, towards Cetus, about 15 degrees below the circlet of Pisces, and 10 degrees west of the star Denobkatos Shimali, or Iota Ceti. Um, it's magnitude 3.5 star, it's right at the tip of Cetus's tau, so if you look for that, it's, that's how to find it. Okay, and if you fancy some globular cluster action, of course, who doesn't, then I'm going to po point you towards uh, Aquila, which is the sort of overlooked constellation of the Summer Triangle. Most of the focus is always on Lyra and Cygnus, um, but the southern tip of the triangle holds some real deep sky gems. Uh, there's a really nice planetary down there as well. So I'm going to point you at NGC 6760. Uh, which is a magnitude 9.1, and it's over six arc minutes across. It's a really interesting loose globular cluster, um, and it's located on the western side of the constellation. If you find Altair and work south to Delta Aquilae, and then extend that line another four degrees, you should fall on your target. 
um, and imaging in large scopes reveal a much more extensive cluster than you can see visually. So it's a really interesting uh, object. Jenny. We're August and all the kiddies are off school, which means it's the perfect time to get them hooked on astronomy. So as such, I'm going to suggest some double stars. You won't need super dark skies for them and you'll be able to point them out on the sky as they appear as one and then show them through the telescope that there are actually more and then you can watch their tiny little brains explode with awe. <laughs> it's brill. So start them off with a good one. That's Albario in Cygnus, the swan. Albario marks the head of the swan and with the naked eye looks just like a bright star. But look through a telescope and you'll see the dichotomy of blue and yellow dancing away in the darkness. Next up is Epsilon Lyrae, lying in the constellation of Lyra. It makes a triangle at the top of the parallelogram of Lyra with Vega. And Epsilon Lyrae is great because you look at it with the naked eye, you'll see a star. And then with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you'll see two. But crank up the magnification again and each of those stars res will resolve into two. So yeah, four in total. Then finally, I'll leave it up to you. Trail Isar, maybe otherwise known as Epsilon Buertis in Buertis. This is a beautiful yellow and white pair, although many people say that the companion looks blue, which is just a trick of the eye. But perhaps you'll return to Cygnus and have a look at Delta Cygni, which is on the bend of the wing of the swan, which is a brilliant white and yellow pair. Well, that only leaves us with our factoids on astronomy object. And this month, I've gone for a lovely little reflection nebula that's great for telescopic observation or astro imaging. NGC 7023, Coldwell 4, or the Iris Nebula. Well, factoid one. Although NGC 7023 is used to mean a nebula, it's in fact only the official designation of the star cluster that sits in the middle of the nebula. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Factoid numero two. The nebula itself shines brighter from our vantage point than the star that's illuminating the gas and dust. The star shines a magnitude 7 and the nebula at 6.8. As a 18 by 18 arc minute nebula, it can be imaged in any size telescope. You'll easily reveal the flower shaped tendrils of the nebula and the dark dust lanes. So I really would recommend getting out there and taking a look at it in a telescope or astro imaging it if that's your bent. As a circumpolar deep sky object, it's visible all year from northerly European and American latitudes, but it is highest in the sky for observing in the summer. And factoid five, the Iris Nebula is known to be filled with hydrocarbons, very similar to soot from car or aircraft exhausts or barbecue grill. And as Jenna said, you can find this object any time of the year, but the spring and summer months will be the best, especially if you're observing rather than imaging it. Find the simple house-shaped constellation of Cepheus the King, high up between Cassiopeia, Ursa Minor and Cygnus, then draw a line from Eri in the apex of the house shape and magnitude 3 Alphurk in the left hand guttering if we're pushing that analogy to its limits. Then continue that line for a third of the distance again and you should have the IP smack on the Iris Nebula. And to finish, we have the moon, which is new on the 1st, first quarter on the 7th, full on the 15th, last quarter on the 23rd, and then back to new on the 30th, which of course is a black moon where we get two new moons in a month. Mm. Clear skies and happy hunting. And so to the question for this month in our astronomy show, and this comes once again from our good friend Mark de Vrij, some say Mark de Vray. Mark says, with the advancements in interferometry, is there a cheap way to produce multiple Hubble scopes to fly in formation and act as a larger interferometer to mimic a larger scope? This will be cheaper as you can mass produce on a known chassis and technology and just switch in or out units as they fail if they're designed with a way to refuel them and they could last as a constellation for a very long time. What's your thoughts? Could this work? Can you interferometer optical and near-infrared scopes like this? So I guess we, we should start off with what interferometry is. So this is where you take multiple instruments and you manipulate the way that the 
uh, light or the light wave crosses over so it amplifies the signal and so that you the the wider you have between two sensors gives you um, uh, a much stronger signal and the more instruments and sensors that you have in between gives you a uh, much better resolution so we, we do it a lot in radio waves but can it be done optically so in theory you can do it with optical um, but the the biggest issue is is the tolerance that you have um, between like the error that you can have on the position of your dishes um, so when you make um, a radio telescope um, you can afford to have sort of bigger errors on the mirror than you can for an optical telescope and that's all because of the wavelength the wavelength in radio is much much longer um, compared to the wavelength that you're using in optical so much like um, if you look at yourself in a mirror and there's a great big smudge across the mirror you see that smudge you see that blemish and it affects the image that you see um, whereas with a radio dish if you put a massive handprint or you even walk about and leave footprints all over the dish you know kick it a bit leave a couple of dents it's not really going to matter because the size of those blemishes compared to the wavelength that it's operating at is so much smaller that it, it doesn't really matter. That's why a lot of radio dishes are just outside in the open air because it really doesn't matter if they get a bit dusty or dirty or they get a chip or something happens to them. Whereas, you know, optical telescopes and everything, they have to be in these protected domes so that the mirrors stay clean. The mirrors have to be regularly cleaned. And it's the same thing with the interferometry that the the spacing of your telescopes and like the position of your telescopes has to be known within the same sort of tolerance as the errors you have on your mirrors. So with a radio telescope, you've got a lot more flexibility um, because the wavelength you're looking at is so much longer. Um, but with optical telescopes, you're really looking at, you'd have to have a positional accuracy that's like within one tenth of the wavelength that you're looking at. Yeah, I think I mean, there's, there's, this has been talked about before then and actually not necessarily interferometry, but using... Um, clusters of, of, of telescopes to work together so very much like mm. the sort of vlt is actually made up of four telescopes to work together so it's about gathering more light but not necessarily building one big instrument but having several instruments work together uh, and this has been done in several places so um so like your huntsman telescope jenny the the where you worked in australia yeah. where you had lots of, of, of instruments working together um, and it reduces cost and weight and things like yeah. that in so, different ways. So you know, it's easier to manufacture rather than one big scope. Um, so they're talking about how you can get you know smaller smaller telescopes, space telescopes wouldn't necessarily have to fly in sort of exact formation and, and work on that sort of interferometry problem. They would just be staring at the same object and and and, and gathering essentially more light as if they were a yeah. bigger scope. And I think you know that is perfectly possible. And in fact if you listen to next month next sort of the next space episode in two weeks time, there is more on that in the news. So a little trail there, yeah, for uh, for a, a coming story about a cluster of satellites doing that sort of thing. Ooh. Ah, let's leave it there then. Okay, marvellous. What a cliffhanger to leave it on. Well, that's our astronomy show for this month, but if all that talk of solar system objects, deep sky treasures, telescopes and wonders of the night skies have you yearning for more, then why not swap talk of such things for joining us in the International Dark Sky Reserve of the Brecon Beacons at Astro Camp. Share the eyepiece with all of us from the 20th to the 24th of September and relax in the tranquility of the Welsh Valleys. Book your place at astrocamp.awesomeastronomy.com for just £45 for three nights. And if you buy us gin, we'll drink it again and get absolutely smashed and do another brilliant episode like we did at the last one. And next time, we might even invite you to come and listen in on the recording if you buy us anything, really. W yes, we might be. Newsflash. We should invite anyone that buys us free stuff to come along and join us in the cottage for a recording. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. But anyway, before all that happens, someone needs to give us a review. We're all delicate little snowflakes and we need our egos boosting. <laughs> Please tell us we're clever. Our mum's telling us is not enough and we need the world to agree. 
Or at least we need iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, Twitter, Facebook to tell us. <laughs> no like us, we need to be told. Well, you know what? Yeah, Give us a review, don't give us a review. Like us, don't like us. Talk to us, <laughs> don't talk to us. But if you do, it's Twitter, at Awesome Astropod. Join the conversation, send us your questions. Retweet us when the episodes go out. And emails at the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Get involved, don't get involved. See you if I care. <laughs> so until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod.com or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission.